is. This question is, is the reason because of an active lifestyle? And the answer is no, it's not because of an active lifestyle. It's because of the geography, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the altitude. Another way of saying that would be you could transport someone um, from somewhere else, you know, say Louisiana into Colorado, change nothing about their lifestyle, nothing about their exercise or eating habits, and, and you would expect them to actually lose weight? Yeah, exactly. You expect them to lose weight. Um, this concept of hypoxia reducing um, uh, energy uh, function, uh, uh, energy utilization, and actually contributing to longevity has actually been shown in animals. So if you actually expose animals to hypoxic regimens, like instead of 20% oxygen, 11% oxygen, okay, they live three times longer. This was work done by a colleague here at UCSF by the name of Isha Jane you know, looking at uh, the role of hypoxia in longevity. And the reason is because of reduction in reactive oxygen species formation. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all internally consistent. Ultimately, yeah. you got to make your mitochondria work better. Yeah, so much of it comes comes down to the mitochondria. I think it knowing does. everything I know today, you know, if, if I had to go back and, and go through school again, and go through the uh, academic science track, I think I would probably study something about mitochondria, probably in the brain, because I, I think agree. that's just a fascinating area and an important one right now. I couldn't agree more, Nick. Uh, you know, I, I, I've become a, uh, you know, uh, self-taught mitochondriologist and um, it's hard. It, it's, it's complex to be, to be sure, but you know, the data are coming in from various, uh, you know, directions uh, and, you know, different places in science demonstrating that mitochondrial function is perhaps, you know, the single most important nidus for understanding the diseases that ail us, you know, mm -hmm. that this is really where the, where the rubber hits the road. I, I refer you to a, a colleague at University of California, San Diego, by the name of Robert Navio, N-A-V-I-A-U-X, and he has done enormous work on reactive oxygen species, external ATP to the cell and the inflammatory response and how mitochondria fit into all of that. It's uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, shall we say a hot topic? Mm -hmm. Um, we've just got a couple minutes left. So I'm going to do a very simple question, um, that is very practical for people, but given so, so health, and nutrition and metabolism, it's sort of inherently difficult area. Uh, and I don't just mean like the, the subject matter is complicated, but um, there's a lot of motivated reasoning. There's a lot of conflicting opinions, even among credentialed experts. And, you know, when you couple that to the proliferation of information that our technology has enabled, you know, you can go watch a podcast with any number of people and there's going to be some level of mutually contradictory information out there. When it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to metabolic health, and you know the science of that general area who are i don't know two or three or four names for people that are out there that are you know on podcasts on the internet writing books or whatever that you think are uh, mostly right or directionally that are worth following for people other than yourself um, aside from myself um so I think David Perlmutter, he's gotten a bad rap, and I think it's totally undeserved. Uh, he, he's a neurologist who wrote Grain Brain, but is totally on board with this no notion and uh, mitochondria being sort of the at the at the you know uh, focal point of uh, cellular physiology. Rick Johnson, Richard Johnson at the uh, University of Colorado. Uh, is also, you know, uh, uh, totally on this and uh, uh, has written about fructose and Alzheimer's and he wrote a book called White Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. And the last person that I would refer you to is Christopher Palmer right there at Harvard. He's at McLean. He's a psychiatrist and he is going to explode the field of metabolic psychiatry. There are other metabolic psychiatrists, Shabani Seti at uh, at Stanford and um, Georgia Ede at uh, also at Harvard, uh, there uh, you know so there are other people in that field too. But Christopher's just done the most, and he's the one who's shown that basically a ketogenic diet can reverse bipolar uh, disorder because it is a biochemical problem, not a behavioral one. And um, you know it's 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 really quite remarkable when mm -hmm. when you see the data and when you hear the stories. It's 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 so uplifting. I would Anything. Say Anything else you want to reiterate for people um, that we talked about? You can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is.
Okay. And we've been, we've gotten the problem wrong for the last 50 years because we were told it was fat. Wrong. Got to fix it. But unfortunately, the food industry doesn't want to fix it. So we, we have a lot of work to do. All right, Robert Lustig, uh, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for having me, Nick. Appreciate it. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything, 